Good afternoon. I'm Nathan Hatch, president of Wake Forest University, and I'd like to welcome you to the Voices of Our Time speaker series, which is part of this very interesting conference, Aging Reimagined, um, the Symposium on Aging uh, Reimagined. Our mission as a university is to educate and inspire individuals for the benefit of society, pro humanitate. This series was created to engage our community with the most relevant minds of our era so that we might reflect on the most pressing questions that we face. In the last few decades, significant attention has been given to health and wellness globally and locally. On our own campus, our commitment to well-being invites all of our community to pursue habits that lead to healthy and meaningful lives. With that in mind, we are pleased to welcome as our featured guest this evening, Dr. Jay Olshansky, a graduate of the University of Chicago with a PhD in sociology, although he tells me he's never published in a sociology journal. <laughs> he's a very interdisciplinary scholar who considers himself a biodemographer, but he tries to understand the mysteries of the aging process. The path has informed his research on the limitations of human longevity and the public policy concerns of slowing the aging process. He co-authored the book, The Quest for Immortality, which has been translated into multiple languages and made available worldwide. His research has also enriched the public sphere. Dr. Olshansky's membership in the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on an aging society connects his findings with other publicly engaged academics. Their work as seen on the National Geographic Channel's series Breakthrough advances the importance of research on aging. He currently serves as a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He also holds research appointments at the Center on Aging at the University of Chicago and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Through his scholarly pursuits, he raises a critical point to both his colleagues in science and our intergenerational communities. In the extension of life, we must focus on the extension of living longer and healthier and meaningful lives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J. Olchansky. All right. Um, first of all, are you able to, to hear me in the back? All right. Thank you so much for having me here, uh, especially this time of year. I'm from Chicago, so you have to realize how nice it is to be able to walk outside without a jacket in 72-degree uh, weather. Also, I, I want to um, let you know that I was here for the previous uh, speaker, and um, you know, I don't, if it wasn't obvious to you, it was obvious to me. Um, she was brilliant, and she did something that, um, that you rarely see uh, in the sciences, in that she, she brought um, disciplines together in ways that you would never anticipate. Uh, and so I was extraordinarily impressed by this. And as you're going to see, she was influenced by somebody um, who also influenced me. Uh, you'll see this um, in a moment. This interdisciplinary approach, I think, is extraordinarily uh, important. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, the past, the present, and the future of human longevity. I'm going to do something that um, that I wasn't asked to do, um, and that is, if you have any burning questions, because I know that there isn't going to be that much time for questions. Really, if there's any burning questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand, interrupt me, uh, because after all, I'm a teacher, and I really like questions, and there are no bad questions. Keep that in mind. And I also challenge you to ask me a question I've never heard before. Not an easy thing to do. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, you're going to get a dose of biology. You're going to get a dose of science here that's absolutely critical to understand why people live as long as we do uh, today, where we're headed in the future, and um, how much longer we can live. And then I'm going to talk about a breakthrough in aging science that I think is about to happen. I don't know who is going to generate this breakthrough. It may be somebody at your own university here. I can tell you, you have an outstanding center on aging here, uh, and they're doing research that I think is 
uh, the type of research that has the potential to be uh, breakthrough technology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these potential scientific breakthroughs in a moment. But ultimately, I'm going to talk about uh, the transformation from this to this. It's really not that complicated uh, when you think about it. Um, so in order for me to look forward, uh, I have to go back. You have to really understand a little bit of the history of why it is that we live as long as we do. So you're going to get a little dose of demography and, and uh, biology and science here that's absolutely critical because without this, none of what I say at the end is really going to make any sense. So you need to know the history. So um, this is one of the most famous lines, this line right here. It's uh, referred to as the Gompertz line or the Gompertz mortality schedule. I'm sure you weren't anticipating I was going to present this, but, um, but as it turns out, you need to understand what this is, why it's here, and why it's important. It's really simple. On the x-axis is age, and on the vertical axis is, uh, is the number of deaths uh, per thousand. This is a semi-log scale, which means when you see a straight line, it means there's an exponential increase in the risk of death. So. This was uh, a line that was created by an actuary by the name of Benjamin Gompertz in 1825. And he was advising an insurance company on how to set premiums for insurance. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to figure out how long people are going to live. So what he discovered in 1825 was something that, wasn't, that is obvious to us today, but it wasn't entirely obvious back in 1825. And that is the longer you live, the higher your risk of death. Right? I mean, they knew that the older you got, the higher the probability that death would occur, but they didn't know the precise mathematics behind it. Benjamin Gompertz identified the precise mathematics. Now, that line right there inspired a very interesting observation from him. Now, I know you're not going to be able to read this in the back of the room, and normally I don't like word slides, but I put this up here for a very specific reason. And I want you to see these words right here. And contemplating on this law of mortality, he looked at that line. And by the way, he replicated that line everywhere he looked, no matter what country he looked at, no matter what population he looked at, males, females, doesn't matter what time period. The timing with which death occurs is always the same for humans. It has never changed. Gompertz's observation in 1825 is exactly the same today. I will show you in a moment. But he saw it as a law of, mort as a, a law, like the law of gravity. That's exactly what he was thinking. I went, by the way, to his reference section in his 1825 paper, and I read all the papers that were in his reference section because I wanted to know why Gompertz was thinking the way he was thinking. This, is, this was my concept of history that we were talking about earlier today. And this was what was influencing Gompertz's uh, thinking. He saw it as a universal biological law that all living things experience an exponential increase in the risk of death with the passage of time. Well, guess what? He was right. There's Gompertz's line right there, and this represents the timing with which death occurs in all, basically in all human populations, no matter what time period you look at, no matter whether you're looking at males, females, whatever country, the timing with which death occurs is always the same. Now take a careful look at this, at the, at this curve here. This is called a J-shaped curve. And you see high early age mortality. The point of lowest mortality is always at puberty. Now there is a biological explanation for this that I'm going to show you in a moment. And then the risk of death rises exponentially thereafter. It has never changed. There's no reason to believe it ever will change. The risk of death doubles about every eight years after puberty in humans. I, what I'm trying to beat into your head, heads here is the concept of constancy. There is a biological law. Gompertz was right. There's no question that the timing with, with, with which this occurs is influenced by fundamental biology. So here's an image to convey this concept. This image, um, you might recognize that name at the bottom, um, Carl Pearson, for the statisticians in the room, that's 
Pearson from Pearson Correlation. And he commissioned an artist to create a picture of the timing of death. Uh, probably most of you have not seen this, including those of you at the, at the Aging Center. It's actually one of my favorite images that I use to teach my students about uh, the timing of death. And by the way, this picture was created uh, from this, right? So that was really the, the source of, of information. The skeletons represent uh, death, the force of mortality or the force of death. And then these individuals here represent people in different regions of the lifespan. And these weapons here represent uh, uh, nature's way of removing people from the population. So what you see here is, uh, is something very straightforward. Uh, remember that high infant mortality? You can see this infant about to be bashed over the head by the force of mortality, a very immediate, quick impact. Uh, a Gatling gun taking out children, meaning a, an efficient way of killing. The least efficient way of killing is with a bow and arrow, which is what you get right at, at puberty. And then it becomes increasingly more accurate with a musket at middle age. And then the force of mortality at the very uh, latest ages uses a rifle, which is another way of saying, I'm going to pick you off with heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's. But if you notice, there's a particular uh, element to this picture that you may not have noticed right off the bat. The force of mortality is looking at its target in every instance but this one. Why does the force of mortality not need to pick off somebody with heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's? Why, does the, why, why don't they even have to look at their target? I'm looking for an answer from somebody. It's, well, the, all right, so, you, so you, you made the correct observation. There's no getting across that bridge, right? Which is another way of saying there's a biological limit to life. Or there's, a, there's a limit to how long we're capable of living. And if heart disease, cancer, and stroke don't get you, aging will. Now, we're starting to get to the message here that I'm trying to get across to you. All right. So in order to understand this, this, uh, this Gompert's law of mortality, you have to know biology. And within biology, you have to know evolution. If you don't understand evolution, you are missing the underlying force that is driving the timing with which death occurs in humans and all other living things. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's, that would be a detailed uh, assessment and uh, uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky provided the best line, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I would argue aging is driven by biology, which means you need to understand evolution to understand uh, aging. So I use, oh, actually, I have to use these pictures to, to illustrate my point, because I always like putting up pictures of my family. So there's my, uh, da my daughter my wife, her mother, and there's my grandson, who's now 18 months old. Um, and that's, uh, that's me just a couple years ago. <laughs> that's my son from a couple years ago. And that was my dad uh, at about uh, in his mid-60s or so. Uh, and then here's a picture of uh, me and my son now. I'm the one on the left. <laughs> and... And that was my, my dad uh, at about 94 or 95. Now, what do you see here, by the way? You see something pretty interesting, right? Look what happened to me. <laughs> Look what happened to him. He was on cruise control for a quarter century. <laughs> he was not really senescing. I mean, really, he was no different at 94 than he was in his, in his 60s, uh, quite frankly. So the question is, why do we go from this to this? Or why do we go from, from this to that in a prescribed time period? This is Gompertz's law. So I'll move through this fairly quickly because it's, it's, um, it's basic evolution biology, but it'll be crystal clear. I will basically, and I'm going to be completely frank with you because you may not like part of these messages, but you didn't bring me here to lie to you, right? So. Um, Humans are incredibly efficient machines, incredibly efficient machines. 
all of which eventually make their way to the junkyard. It's another way of saying death is inevitable uh, in all living things. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but the question is, how long does it take and what happens along the way? Uh, and it, not only does it apply to humans, it applies to almost all sexually reproducing species in exactly the same way. The concept of law, of Gompertz's law of mortality applies to all, almost all living things. That was my dog. Uh, she lived about uh, 5,100 days. It applies to horses. It applies to mice. Basically, almost all sexually reproducing species. So here's the analogy that I like to use. Um, a race car analogy um, from, from uh, Chicago, so the Indianapolis 500 is not that uh, far from me. So I like to use the Indy 500 as sort of a, a good analogy. The engineers who build these cars make sure that they can go at least 500 miles, uh, and they engineer them specifically for that purpose, and hopefully as fast as possible. But if you were to conduct an experiment on Indianapolis 500 race cars, and instead of turning the engine off at 500 miles, you continue to run them around the track until they all fail, you would see a distribution of failure times or death times for these automobiles that is virtually identical to that of humans. There would be some that would die early. There would be some extremely long-lived, well-functioning uh, Mercedes that would make it out uh, for a long time, and there would be a distribution of failure times along the way. Now, the key point, by the way, is that the engineers who build the, built these cars didn't build them to fail. They built them to make it to the end of the race. And if you do something to these cars that you're not supposed to do, which is operate them beyond the end of the race, you get to see things go wrong with them that you wouldn't ordinarily have an opportunity to see. So you see this with your own automobiles. If you operate your car beyond the end of its warranty period, <laughs> things start to fall off. They stop, stop working as well. Well, guess what? Uh, the human body works exactly the same way. And in fact, in this case, uh, we move from a fertilized egg to a reproducing adult. We produce offspring. We ensure the reproductive success of our offspring by making it to grandparenthood. And what have we done during the course of the 20th century? We've pushed out the envelope of survival into the post-reproductive region of the lifespan where natural selection no longer cares about us. That's why diseases... Uh, some diseases in particular are pushed out to outer regions of the lifespan. Either they happen very early before reproduction or at the end of the, or past the end of the reproductive window. Like Huntington's disease, the one that you mentioned um, in your talk. In fact, Huntington's disease happens right around the end of the reproductive window. There's a, an evolutionary explanation for why selection pushes out diseases to the edges and beyond of the reproductive window. What did we do during the course of the, of the 20th century? We, we, we pushed out survival into this region out here, and we now get the opportunity, the privilege of seeing heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. So let me be clear here. The rise of heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's are not a consequence of failure. They are a consequence of success. Living long enough for these diseases to have an opportunity to express themselves. There's a tendency to blame us for many of the diseases that happen to us. And in fact, we deserve that blame sometimes because we can accelerate that process. It's real easy to die early. It's very hard to live long. It's, I mean, it's easy to shorten your life. And I've actually made the case for a long time that the only control we have over our duration of life is to shorten it. We exercise that control all the time. We become obese, we smoke cigarettes, we do, we do things that are harmful, and we know what those things are that are harmful. But even if you avoid all of those harmful risk factors, we still age, we still grow old, and we still die. And in, in all likelihood, we will still die from the same things that we die from today. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's. I'm going to pass by this just because for the sake of time, I do want to put up this slide. Forget the words for the moment. Um, this is actually a pretty important slide. Um, what I'm showing you here is I've essentially taken the lifespan of humans and I've divided it into three regions, the pre-reproductive region, the reproductive region, and the post-reproductive region of the lifespan. Now, there's a couple of critical messages in here. 
as soon as we begin reproduction, puberty, the ability of natural selection to influence gene frequencies begins to decline. And it reaches zero in the post-reproductive region of the lifespan. What does this mean? It means that evolution could not have given rise to either aging genes, an aging clock, or death genes. There is no clock that is ticking that is designed to take you out. It doesn't exist. What there is is a genetically fixed program for growth, development, and reproduction. Everything here is genetically orchestrated. It is like an orchestra. If you see the developmental changes that occur in your children and grandchildren, it is a consistent pattern. That's how natural selection operates. It takes us to reproduction, we produce offspring, and then what have we done? We've pushed out survival into this region of the lifespan, and that's where you see Huntington's and you see heart disease, cancer, stroke, and Alzheimer's, and lots of bad things happen out there. And why does natural selection not care? You've already passed your genes on to the next generation. It's too late. This is why you see the point of lowest mortality of puberty, by the way. Classic evolutionary explanation for an observed demographic phenomenon. Yes? Men do not? Well, actually, we do. Um, so this question comes up all the time. If anyone didn't hear the question, uh, the question was, this looks like it only applies to menopause at women when, in fact, you know, what's going on with men may be a little bit different. Actually, the fact is that we've written an entire manuscript answering this particular uh, question. I'll give you the short answer. The short answer is, is that if you look at the timing with which reproduction occurs in males and females, um, we refer to it as reproductive output. <laughs> It's a crude way of saying how many babies are you producing throughout the lifespan. And as it turns out, 70, I think it's 70 or 75 percent of all reproductive output in humans everywhere in the world is accomplished by the age of 32. And what's really important here is fecundity, not fertility, the ability to reproduce. Um, and as it turns out, most men, I mean, it's true, some men over the age of 50 are producing offspring. It's exceedingly rare. Uh, for this to happen. It does happen. Yeah, yes. How, how old was he when he... He was how old? Strom Thurmond? Yeah, it's, it's exceedingly rare when that happens. But look, here's the message here. Now keep this in mind. Duration of life of species is calibrated to reproduction. It's calibrated to the length of this window. The onset and length of the, re this is the answer to Gompertz's law of mortality, by the way. Duration of life is calibrated to reproduction. It's not calibrated to other things that you think it's calibrated to. The onset and length of the reproductive window determines how long species live. And as it turns out, it applies within species as well. So you might be asking, what does this mean for you? It means that women, for example, who go through natural menopause late, tend to live significantly longer than women who go through natural menopause early. If you're fecund, capable of reproducing into your 50s, especially mid to late 50s, you will tend to see exceptional longevity in these individuals, even if they have harmful behavioral risk factors, like smoking. I'm going to show you some examples of this a little bit later. It doesn't mean you should be picking up smoking, by the way. <laughs> so a mouse goes through puberty. A mouse, uh, goes through puberty at about 30 days, it lives about 1,000. A dog goes through puberty at about nine months, it lives about 5,000 days. Uh, elephants live about 26,000 days. Humans, we live about 29,000 days. These are remarkably accurate statistics, by the way. I use days for a very good reason. Um, and we, we go through puberty at about 11 to 12 years of age. A uh, sea turtle goes through puberty at Puberty at 50, five zero years of age, it can reproduce for 100 years and live for 150. And a bowhead whale uh, can live for 210 years, 77,000 days. I don't know when a bowhead whale goes through puberty or menopause. But. 
in case anyone was going to ask. I don't know the answer to that. So uh, you, uh, I hope you're, I'm trying to get a consistent message across to you. There's a constancy that we see in the timing of death, and it's influenced by genetics, it's influenced by biology, and right now we can't control that. Now, this was the slide I told you I was going to include. Uh, I added this in at the last minute. This was a piece of research that my colleagues and I published almost 20 years ago where um, we documented Gompertz's law of mortality by applying the basic principle and concept to other species. Basically, what Gompertz observed for humans, we have now observed for mice, dogs, and most other sexually reproducing species. And the key here may or may, may, may not be obvious to you. If you take the duration of life of shorter-lived species and you stretch out the, the timing with which death occurs so that the time frame is consistent with that of humans, in other words, if you control for time, which often is not done in the world of aging science, what you find is that all of the developmental events that occur in all of these species happen at the exact same time. Gompertz was right. It's not just a law of mortality. It's a law of development. All of these events are happening at the same time. It's just that you know, we see a, our dogs going through puberty at nine months. Well, when you control for time, as it turns out, that nine months is the equivalent of 11, roughly 11 years for humans, 11 to 12 years for humans. These, these, ha these events are happening at the same time. You just have to control for time. Not often not done in the scientific literature. So um, having been a runner myself for many, many years, I like using running analogies. So there's no genetic program that says that this woman is incapable of running a one-minute mile. I tried running a four-minute mile in my younger days. I couldn't do it. Um, but there's no program in our bodies that says you can't run a one-minute mile. But you can't run a one-minute mile. The biomechanics of the human body make it impossible for that to happen. And it's also true that there, while, there, uh, there, while there is no genetic program that limits duration of life, there is nevertheless a limit to duration of life. And we have to recognize that those limits exist. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, jeez. All right. Yeah, I knew I was going to do this. Um, all right. I'm going to – I just want to show you a couple of things uh, here, and then I have to – I haven't even gotten to my most important message yet. Um, so uh, my colleagues and I published this article in 2001. You recognize that name there? Um, Bob Butler, the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, the one who had that profound influence on you. He had the same profound influence on me and my colleagues. Um, what we did was we asked a very basic question, and that is uh, there is no designer, we would argue, for the human body. It wasn't designed. Uh, and most of what happens in the post-reproductive region of the lifespan is an accident of surviving essentially beyond the biological warranty period uh, for our bodies. So we asked the question, well, what would happen if we, if we took over the design? Could we design things better than they are now? And what would they look like if we could? We had a lot of fun with this paper, I will, will tell you. So we took a look at the things that go wrong with the human body now. Uh, so we were talking earlier about um, the compression of the vertebrae that happens uh, because we're, we're upright. Well, bipedal locomotion, you know, it's really great for getting from point A to point B, but it creates all kinds of problems with our knees, our hips, our ankles, our vertebrae, lower back, all kinds of problems. So fortunate for you, we fixed them all. Um, we're just going to show you some classic examples. This, again, this was Scientific American in 2001. Classic examples, this crossing of the food in the air passageway in the back of the throat, it's a really bad design. Uh, and you know this when you choke on your food or your whatever it is that you're drinking. You recognize this is a bad design. We lose our hearing with the passage of time, the uh, uh, loss of... Uh, of uh, hair cells in the inner ear. I've actually lost 50% of the hearing in this ear and 20% of the hearing in this ear. 
And you might ordinarily think this would be a bad thing. And I'm not wearing hearing aids yet. Um, and the reason why it's not a bad thing, and I told you I was going to tell you the reason why, is that because it's forced me to be a much better listener. So here's an example of an adaptation, very much like what you were talking about. An adaptation that occurs um, with, with uh, you know, an unwanted developmental event that forces you to do something that's actually better for you. Um, so I'm actually a much better listener than I used to be. Um, problems with the eyes, well, those are easy to fix. Uh, what we did was we uh, raised the trachea. There's a, another uh, animal that has something exactly like that. It's a horse. Uh, of course, the disadvantage for the horse is it can't speak. Um, but it can drink and breathe at the same time, and we can. We uh, increased the size of the outer ear. We made it mobile. You might recognize that because that design was stolen by Avatar. Um, and all, we got it from Dr. Spock, as you might imagine. You, I recognize that ear. And then we borrowed the attachment of the optic nerve to the retina from a, a squid. Oops, I lost that one. Right up here. Um, it's a much more stable, a squid has a much more stable connection. This is one of the worst designs possible. <laughs> You never pass a liquid through a tube through an organ that encloses with the passage of time. The male prostate is a disaster. Um, and the fix, my father was a plumber. <laughs> so I can credit him with giving us this particular design. And he basically, you know, I'd ask my dad, what do you think, dad, of the design of the prostate, who had prostate cancer, by the way? And um, he said, it's the work of an apprentice. <laughs> Not designed very well. So there's what the animal looks like when it's all pieced together. Look, we, you know, we actually didn't argue that we could. Oh, these were some of the stories that appeared in the news after this article came out. This was in uh, the Singapore Times. This was in San Francisco Chronicle. Lots of stories came out. It was a lot of fun to write. The point here was not that we can actually design better than what we have, but that we have to live with the design that, that we were born with. And we have to recognize that there are fun, functional limitations to the way in which our body operates. All right, um, I'm gonna show you this slide and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the good news because I'm pretty sure I've been giving you all bad news up to this point. This actually, I've actually given an entire hour's talk on this one slide, believe it or not. So as it turns out, this is the most important slide I'm going to show you. If you took 100,000 babies born in a given year, let's say 1,900, and you applied to those babies the death rates at all ages, and you plotted out the ages at which all those babies would die, you would get what's referred to as a distribution of death. If there's any actuaries in the room, this is the DX column of the life table. But for the rest of us, it's just the distribution of death. So what do you see here? You see a distribution, this is for females. You see a distribution of death. There's high infant uh, and child mortality. There's a bump right around age 20 uh, for females in 1900. What's that? Maternal mortality. And then if you made it past the first couple of decades, you had a decent chance of living out to your 60s, 70s, and 80s. What did we do in the 20th century? We pushed down, we brought down early age mortality, right? You now see it down here. We shifted the distribution to older ages. Now most death, deaths occur past the age of 65. We built what I would refer to as the mountain of mortality. Right? This is where bad things happen out here. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, and Alzheimer's. And, and I placed it against the backdrop of what I refer to as the red zone. Red zone is a perfect football analogy, especially if you're from Chicago and you, the you know, the Bears get inside the 20-yard line. They basically can't score a touchdown. <laughs> well, it, when it comes to human longevity, once you push out the envelope of survival pretty far, it becomes more increasingly more difficult to push it out further. Now, since most people now uh, are dying past the age of 65 in long-lived populations, what happens if we continue to reduce the risk of death from heart disease, cancer, stroke, 
and Alzheimer's. Or let me just let me let me rephrase that. What happens if we reduce the risk of death from heart disease, cancer, and stroke? Those are the three main killers. We get Alzheimer's. We get Alzheimer's. There are fundamental trade-offs that occur with life extension, and we have to recognize that those trade-offs are going to happen. Uh, and so what we argue, and what many of us have argued, is that instead of focusing all of our attention on the fatal diseases that are expressed in this region of the lifespan, instead, we should be focusing in on the fundamental biological process of aging that gives rise to all of them. And if you make a minor advancement in an effort to slow down the biological process of aging, a minor deceleration in the rate of aging would yield improvements in the risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, everything we don't like about growing older. So the argument that we have been making in the field of aging science is that the time has arrived to alter our fundamental relationship with disease. And instead of attacking disease itself, go after aging. What are, what are we trying to do here? We are not trying to achieve life extension. We are not trying to make us live longer. We are not trying to push out the envelope of survival. We are trying to compress this red zone. We're trying to push out this line so that it happens later, so that you can be physically youthful for a longer time period. That's all we are trying to achieve, and I believe uh, science is on the verge of an advancement just like this. All right, let me pass by all this stuff. This was all exciting therapeutic cloning, advances in technology that are all very exciting. You know, regenerative medicine, none of them influence aging, by the way. Um, and by the way, we have a huge Achilles heel uh, between our ears that we are not yet able to manipulate very well. So if you push out the envelope of survival and you don't simultaneously slow down the aging of the brain, you've got a disaster. So we don't want life extension without health extension. All right, let me pass by this. Let me pass by this. I can tell you that, that uh, a number of articles have been published on this new concept of slowing the biological process of aging. We published this in The Scientist in, I can't remember, 2006 maybe. You can see Bob Butler was on this one as well. Um, we published another piece in the British Medical Journal in 2008 written for physicians. There's Bob's name up at the top. You know, Bob is smiling down on you and I uh, right now. Um, a number of organizations have come together to push this concept of what we refer to as a longevity dividend initiative, which is another way of saying, let's extend the period of healthy life by slowing down the biological process of aging. We are working very hard to make this happen as quickly as possible. I can tell you some of the research that's going on here at this university, hopefully, is the groundbreaking research that will lead to the type of intervention that we're, we're talking about. We published a book on this just a couple of months ago. Uh, I uh, co-edited this with uh, George Martin at, uh, at uh, the University of Washington, Jim Kirkland from the Mayo Clinic. And then there was a breakthrough series that was published that was uh, um, uh, made available by the National Geographic Channel that came out last November. You could, I think you can look it up and see it on your own. We had some breakthroughs that happened in that. It'll give you a good sense of, of what's going on in the field. Oh, all right. I'm so not going to say the major listen. medical breakthrough in modern history. Was it anesthesia, antibiotics, or vaccination? Was it the wonders of medical imaging, from x-rays and ultrasounds to CAT scans? Or pacemakers, coronary angioplasty, heart transplants, or genetic engineering? Could it have been drugs like Prozac, statins, or even Viagra? No, it was the discovery and dissemination of basic public health, such as sanitation, hand washing, refrigeration, and indoor living and working environments. Before the 1850s, we didn't understand its importance in warding off communicable diseases and people died as a result, often in thousands and almost always at very young ages. 
public health fundamentally changed what it means to be human. Along with modern medical breakthroughs, it was simple things like clean water and sanitation that helped humans dramatically change the conditions under which we live, enabling us to experience much longer lives and for the first time with great regularity, the biological aging of our bodies. We succeeded in adding 30 years on average to the lives of individuals in many parts of the world over the last century. A dramatic achievement to be sure, but the real question is where does this leave us now? Is there a price we have to pay for the privilege of living longer? The answer is a definitive yes. While communicable diseases once killed us at a young age, today many more people live long enough for the privilege of experiencing chronic degenerative diseases associated with old age. Fragile bones, muscle atrophy, cancer, heart disease, sensory impairments, all signs that the human body was not designed for long-term use. In fact, we may have already reached or in a way actually exceeded the biological limitations of our bodies. When people reach older ages with both mind and body intact, it's a wondrous thing to behold. But where one or the other doesn't make it, the result can be devastating. A prolongation of old age, the very thing many of us fear most. Under these conditions, longer lives can be emotionally and financially challenging for the dying as well as family and friends. But aging and old age need not be thought of only as a time of loss and decline. For increasingly larger segments of society, healthy and productive aging is normal, representing a unique opportunity that few people throughout history had an opportunity to experience. A healthy older life can and should be nurtured. Today, a new medical breakthrough stands before us that may be as important as public health a century ago. I believe science is on the verge of discovering a longevity dividend. The health and economic benefits that would accrue to individuals and societies resulting from a successful effort to slow biological aging. Science is not there yet, but if we find a way to extend the period of youthful vigor, even by just a few years, the trade-off of chronic diseases for 30 years of life that public health brought us in the last century will yield a new and more positive way of thinking about aging and the extended lives many of us enjoy. All right, so you have to have to realize how unusual aging is. You don't really see it in the animal world except under unusual circumstances. Your pets, laboratory animals, and zoo animals. Almost all, almost all other animals in the wild die well before they have an opportunity to grow old. Most of you, had you been, been, been born a century and a half ago, had you been around the beginning part of the 20th century, you wouldn't have lived as long as you're living now. So aging has been an absolutely remarkable, extraordinarily quick event. And we are now reaping the benefits and paying the price. And the question is, where are we headed in the future? That's the $64,000 question. And I've argued for quite some time that if we continue along this particular path, uh, towards um, uh, efforts to modulate diseases only without influencing the biological process of aging that we may see an extended period of frailty and disability. In other words, we can lower the risk of cancer, we can lower the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, and I believe we will continue to do so, but the price we may have to pay may be an elevation in the, uh, uh, in, um, in the prevalence and the, uh, and the onset, let's see, that's not the word I wanted to use. In the onset, prevalence, and duration of conditions of frailty and disability expressed in later regions of the lifespan. We're not going to like it if we live longer without health extension. And therein lies the danger. There are lots of pathways that researchers are pursuing to slow biological aging. I, I had to put these pictures up here, by the way. There's Jeanne Calmon, the world's longest lived person. She made it to 122. She smoked for 100 years. <laughs> you can see this individual clearly um, <laughs> is demonstrating that she smoked. Now, this is not a license to smoke. 
the vast majority of the people who smoke will die earlier than they would have otherwise. So please, please, please don't interpret it that way. What it means is, is that smoking was not a risk factor for her, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why these centenarians and super centenarians are so interesting to study. Because many of them can do incredible harm to their bodies and still live out for 100, 110, even 120 years. What is it that's protecting them? That's what some researchers are trying to find. If uh, you had Nir Barzilai here from Albert Einstein, he would be telling you that uh, the genetics of these individuals is protecting them, and he's trying to discover what those genes are. But researchers are also looking at caloric restriction, a number of compounds, uh, you know, rapamycin, uh, uh, resveratrol, uh, metformin. There's lots of compounds that are out there that, that researchers are looking for. Yeah. Ah, really interesting question. Um, the question was, is there any way to delay puberty? Um, so I would actually be less interested in delaying puberty and more interested in delaying menopause. It's the end that's important, not the beginning. Um, yeah, I realize I only have a couple minutes. Um, he wants me to wind it up here. <laughs> They're saying, um, look, this experiment has actually been conducted uh, where researchers, it was done with fruit flies, but, um, <laughs> but what they did was they took uh, successive generations of fruit flies that were fecund later and later, and they allowed only those that were fecund later and later to pass their genes on to the next generation. Each subsequent generation lived longer than the next. What? Yeah. Well, uh, no, no, it was fecundity. It was the end, not the beginning. Yeah, fecundity. Yes. So what about the fact that the puberty seems to be happening earlier? Yeah, the question was why, uh, what's going on with puberty happening earlier. It's happening earlier uh, largely because of body fat. Uh, malnutrition in the early part of the 20th century led to puberty that was about 17 to 18 uh, in most developed countries. It's, this is what you're, what you're seeing now is the genetic potential that always existed within humans. So if you took people from the early 20th century, you brought them to the present, you increased their body fat, you would get to see a, a normal expression of puberty. Now we are seeing some aberrations of puberty that are occurring as a result of extreme obesity in young children. So we're now seeing puberty occurring among some eight and nine year old kids. There may actually be some cases that are younger than that because of extreme obesity. So we are artificially altering that process, but it would be the end of the reproductive window that I'd be more interested in manipulating. And in fact, in humans, if you were to conduct the experiment and only allow women that are fecund uh, later and later into their later and later 50s to pass their genes on to the next generation, we would in all likelihood see life extension in humans. It's, not, it's an experiment that's not going to happen, of course. I, I have to end, so I'm sorry you're not going to get a dose of parabiosis. Um, and I, I do have to show you, I have to show you this picture and then one last one. Um, the gentleman, this is a father-son. The guy on the right, how old is he? 73. Anyone else? He looks like he's in his 50s. That's the answer we get most often. He's actually 70 years old. His father uh, is over 100. Now, this is a consistent pattern that we see. If you look at photographs of the offspring of long-lived people, they almost always look younger for their age, almost throughout their lives. So look, I just gave you three, I think it was three examples of things that you can actually look at in yourself. Do you look younger for your age? And have you looked younger for your age your whole life? Do you go through natural menopause late? <laughs> I'm not looking at you for a reason, by the way. Um, um, <laughs> do, 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 uh, late would be, late would be mid, mid to late 50s. But even early 50s is better than late 40s. Um, but still. Uh, looking younger for, uh, for your age, uh, late menopause, and having uh, relatives, parents, and grandparents that live past the age of 85. You see that consistently among centenarians. 
Um, so many of those folks can pretty much do whatever they want to their bodies, and they're going to live a really long life. And I'm going to end with this cartoon <laughs> as a warning. <laughs> to be careful what you wish for. And I think I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jay. I'm going to ask a question or so and then uh, open the floor for your questions. If, if I could uh, switch gears for a minute and just talk about our aging society. Yesterday I saw figures that North Carolina's population, which by 2030 will be about 12 million people, the seventh largest state. Today, uh, about 13% of North Carolina's population is over 65. It's projected by 2030 it will be 20%. So what do you see as a social impact of an aging society? Look, there's a tendency to view this rapid aging of our society, and that's referred to as population aging. Mm -hmm. This shift in the age structure, many more older people, there's a tendency to look at it as a, as a bad thing. As like a, 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 some have referred to it as a silver tsunami. Um, and tsunami is associated with harm, right? And, and at the MacArthur Foundation Research Network, I can tell you that we have been working really hard to dismantle this myth uh, that aging is bad for us. In fact, the argument that, that we have been making is that this uh, healthy, when you can get a healthy older population, this population is worth its weight in gold. It's an extremely valuable resource. <laughs> I well, sense selective clapping. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, you have to realize that lots of countries consider this to be a, a bad phenomenon. Yeah. And what we are recognizing is, is that it's a resource that we have to learn to tap into. We need to change our, our laws and our policies to allow and enable people to remain in the labor force longer should they wish to do so. Uh, that should be entirely their choice. We, you know, we have a, a tendency to push people out, and I think that's a, a, a huge mistake. And really, understanding the dynamics, the unusual dynamics of what's going on with older folks, which I think you illustrated really well uh, with your presentation, sort of allows us to see a picture of aging differently than the way in which we've been taught, which is, a, you know, the way in which many of us have been taught is aging is all associated with loss, decline, and decay. It's not. And once we recognize that, it, that done the right way, it can be associated with great value, and we need to tap that resource, I think you should look upon the aging of your state as a positive thing, not a negative thing. Great. What's the single most promising research being done that would uh, stop aging? Or that might slow aging. Slow aging. Yeah, stopping aging is not in the cards. Right. Um, <laughs> reversing aging isn't in the cards. Right. Um, so now you're just going to get a personal opinion. You'd probably get a different opinion from other people in the audience here who are far more uh, advanced uh, than I am. But I can tell you that, that my own excitement, greatest excitement, is in the study of the genetics of long-lived people. We don't have to cross species, you know, from fruit fly or roundworm to human. Look, if you, if you are already older, if you're already over the age of 85, you've got long-lived parents, long-lived grandparents, you went through, you know, menopause late, in all likelihood, you are you are aging more slowly than the rest of us. In other words, we can see it, we can measure it. People in the audience here are probably already experiencing this. And if you've got the genes, we want to know what those genes are. <laughs> that, you're 90? Yeah. Are you a daughter? No? OK, I don't know. Um, that's a bad question, by the way. <laughs> Granddaughter. <laughs> No, so, so really, so what's interesting is, is that the, the, the study of the genetics of exceptionally long-lived people, I think, is perhaps leading us down a very quick path towards the identification of genes and the gene products that will allow us to essentially provide your advantage that you have to the rest of us who may not have the same probability of surviving healthy to older age as you have experienced. And I think that's extraordinarily exciting, but look, uh, trust me, there's lots of other exciting work. That I was, was going to show you one on parabiosis, 
which is the connection of the cardiovascular system of younger and older people, which is showing really interesting promise. And then there's compounds like rapamycin and, and uh, 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 lots of other things that are being studied. They're all extraordinarily exciting. I know the work that you're doing here is, is also has great potential. Uh, so I don't know which one. It's just a personal opinion at this point, but it's, yeah. it's a real exciting time yeah. to be in the world of aging science. Yeah. Great. Let me open the floor to your questions. I'm, I'm, out, I'm joking, but what do you think? Well, all right. Um, in case you didn't hear, it was a dating site that shows you the pictures of your, your grandparents and grandparents, essentially. So, you know, look, there's an old saying, if you want to know what your wife is going to look like or be like, um, take a look at her mother uh, or her, her, her grandmother. Yeah, it's, you know, somewhat. Your mom made it to 97? So are you willing to reveal when you went through menopause? <laughs> you don't want to tell us? No. <laughs> so uh, she said she didn't remember. And actually, it's, it's interesting because it's, of course, not a discrete event. Um, you know, it doesn't happen in a, in a single day. And so some people don't actually always know. I can tell you that insurance companies in all likelihood are going to be asking this question in the future when they're underwriting um, individuals only because I'm advising these insurance companies now. Um, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> What's that? That's a very thing. Well, look, the, 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 you, should actually, you should actually want this. This kind of information will lower your premiums. You want to you want to actually have have lower premiums that's associated with exceptional longevity. Okay. Yes. Back. Yeah. Use the mic if you would, please. <laughs> so you talked about how it would be possible for us to reach diseases or push them further away by having reaching degradation. So menopausal reaching, having a slower clock, would it be possible to trick our bodies into thinking that it can still ha to still be into in a rep reproductively active, even though it isn't, just to repel? Well, so the, yeah, no, really good question. So that's what um, some researchers are suggesting uh, hormone replacement therapy might be doing, but it's also raising the risk of, of certain forms of cancer in some older women. So there's a danger. Uh, associated with that. But there was some research that came out just recently in the last couple of weeks on caloric restriction, suggesting that, um, you know, originally the caloric, re reducing your caloric intake by, I can't remember, what is it, 30% um, below whatever your normal maintenance would be, it has a life extending property, more like health extending property. But what these researchers discovered recently was you don't actually have to do it every day. You only have to do it a couple of, a couple of days a week. So um, it may be possible to achieve this in other ways, simple ways. And only deny dessert twice a week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that sound appealing? Yeah. Does it matter how the menopause came, that it was a natural process or through surgery or something else? It's um, yeah, so every time I refer to it, I refer to natural menopause. Um, when, when menopause is occurring for surgical reasons. I actually don't know the answer to how that influences longevity. Um, I, I just don't know. By the way, the question of exercise, you, me you mentioned exercise. I'm always asked the question, what's the most important thing that you can do today to influence your quality and duration of life? If there's one equivalent of a fountain of youth that exists now, it would be exercise. Um, exercise is to your body what an oil lubina filter is to your car. You don't have to do it, but when you do it, your car operates with much greater efficiency and your body and mind operates with much greater efficiency. There's very strong evidence that exercise has a powerful effect on the functioning of both body and mind, and we can actually retain that 
physical and mental functioning much longer if you exercise. It doesn't mean you can eliminate disease entirely. It just means you can extend healthy life. Very powerful. Right. No, right. It's the same story. Absolutely. Uh, in this country, we uh, put a lot of money behind heart research and various other diseases. But as a country, uh, do you have the kind of financing behind you to, for the kind of research that you are doing? Great question. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. The vast majority of the money, for example, uh, from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is going to the Heart Institute, the Cancer Institute, Alzheimer's disease. A very small amount is going toward the biological process of aging itself. So this longevity dividend initiative that we're talking about here, we are not seeking funding from the NIH. We are seeking funding from the Billionaires Club. We are essentially traveling around the world and trying to get uh, high net worth individuals to create a large investment in aging science to accelerate the work in this area because aging is going to, is, I mean, you showed this, the stats uh, for this state. It's happening everywhere across the globe. It's happening very rapidly. So we're suggesting that the, the time is absolutely critical that we move as quick as we can to accelerate research in aging science. And, and I only see it coming from high net worth individuals, the NIH, doesn't have enough money coming quick enough to address the kind of aging science that we're, we're talking about. That's a critical One question. more question. There seems to be a wave of information that's come out now by a number of doctors, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. David Perlmetter, and Perlmetter is both a, a neuro, neurologist, I think, uh, and a board-certified nutritionist, and the only doctor, I think, in the U.S. that has that certification. And they're promoting, which... I tend to agree with that um, we should not be eating grains, we should not be eating wheat, we, it raises the blood sugar twice as fast as sugar actually does, and that we should be eating vegetables, a little bit of fruit, fat, because the brain is primarily fat and we need to feed the fat brain. And um, the programs are just amazing and they are promoting that you do fast, rest the body for periods of time. Exercise is very important, they're saying. So all of this seems like it's on a huge new wave that's just surged up that if you watch PBS, you'll see all of this. And I, I don't know if they're right. Look, I can tell you that if you look at the, at the age pyramids, age pyramids, <laughs> the food pyramids, I'm so used to age pyramids, right? If you look at the food pyramids that the nutritionists have been giving us for the last couple of decades, they've just been one mistake after another. Now, I don't know if this is the next mistake. Uh, or not. I don't, I don't know, and they don't really know either. What I can tell you is, is that there is a very powerful movement underway now to move us back towards the anci uh, ancient foods, maybe the right way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, non-processed. It's not just non-processed, but it's actually the non-genetically modified uh, organisms that we've created. Um, there was a book that came out called, uh, I think it was the Taco Effect or something, something along those lines, um, where they, they went to these uh, sources of protein and uh, fruits and plants that, that, uh, where the genes for these uh, came from more than a century ago. And what was interesting about, about these fruits and vegetables and proteins, because I actually went to the, the uh, uh, culinary Institute in California, where they, the guy who created from farm to table created a whole menu uh, based on these foods alone. And the argument that they were making, which was absolutely fascinating, was that you actually eat, th these foods are highly um, dense in flavor and in nutrients. And under those conditions, with a higher density of, uh, of nutrients and flavor, you tend to eat less. Uh, and he served us a series of small portions uh, during the course of the evening, and it was absolutely spectacular. And I can tell you that the new movement is, you know, the way in which we tend to eat our foods now is that we have this big plop of meat right in the middle, and then we have these side dishes of vegetables around the outside. And I, and I think this may be where uh, Perlmutter and others are, are, are arguing, is that the, the meat is 
needs to be the side dish. And everything else needs to be the primary food that we eat, the fruits and the vegetables. Now, whether it's the ancient grains or not, I don't really know. I don't know if that's the next mistake, but... Remember, you're in North Carolina, the home of barbecue. <laughs> Look, I'm a, a big fan of barbecue. I'm wearing some of it. Yes. Yeah. And chocolate. Yeah. My wife is exactly the same. And she has uh, celiacs. Please. Please join me in thanking Dr. Olchanky for a wonderful presentation. Thanks to all of you for coming, and have a great evening. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun. Great group, of course.